raise a glass to the past And the ladies cross the ages Fallen fathers from the motherland Whose lives are on the pages And the father said it best When he told us all the world's a stage So fellas, grab a glass And lift your spirits to the seventh age Welcome one and all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub, going in pursuit of lost knowledge and lost colonists in the New World and also what archaeology might be able to reveal about them and their whereabouts. As always, I know the whereabouts of my cohorts and comrades, Jason and James, the Seven Ages Research Associates. Gentlemen, how are we doing? Hey, doing great. Um, uh, you know, nice and toasty. I'm getting ready to uh, prepare for hitting the road next uh, month. It's about that time. I uh, got a lot of things to get out there and see. Uh, but we're going to be heading up to the uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway again for another little camping excursion where we met with you uh, last year. And I'm uh, going to pop over to uh, Sevierville, Tennessee for a couple of days and then uh, round it out for a couple of days in Asheville before we head back home. Well, excellent. I certainly hope to see you while you're up this way. You know, I'm here in Asheville as well, doing my thing. Working day in, day out. But, you know, the weather's been nice, so I can't really complain. James, how are things looking out your way, sir? Well, they've been a little soggy lately, but uh, you know what? It's good to be on the mic with you guys. It seems like we haven't been on here in about six months or so. <laughs> I got a, I had a, I bought a brand new pair of headphones here a while back, and uh, they were just sitting over here collecting dust. So, uh, But they sound good, and uh, I don't think I've got as much stuff going on as Jason does. I think I'm more like you, where I'm just slaving away day after day in the sitting here in the studio, you know? Yeah. I don't think anybody out there really knows all the projects I have going. I'm, I promise you the busiest person that you'll ever meet. I actually had a friend recently kind of, uh, say to me, is, is it really possible that you could be as busy as you claim you are? Cause I really don't think you are. And I had to explain, yes, I am quite busy. I am indeed. But you know, busy is good. Business is good. In fact. And, uh, you know, it was actually really warm here today. Uh, I had been making plans for my mom's birthday this weekend. And I had been, you know, putting together the menu because I like to cook for the family. You guys know that. But when I saw what the weather was looking like and how warm it was going to be, we had to kind of do an about face with our dinner plans because I was like, you know, this is grilling weather. So let's get out there and grill. We're going to be cooking outside. So I'm really excited about that. You know, it gets even hotter in certain other places. One of the places you wouldn't expect to see that kind of heat is Iceland. And James, I know that you've been saying recently that there's a lot of volcanic activity happening up that way. Yeah, you know, so Iceland has had this like continuous uh, volcanic eruption going on for the last, I don't know, a couple of months or so. And uh, there's, you know, there's some YouTube channels that live stream it like 24-7, which is kind of cool. Uh, I think the, like geologically speaking, the interesting thing about Iceland is Iceland exists because of volcanism, you know, period. It's just kind of one big, uh, one big, uh, volcanic Island. And, um, it sets right on, it's actually a surface expression, you know, an above water expression of the uh, mid Atlantic Ridge, which runs longitudinally, um, up, you know, North, South to the Atlantic ocean for thousands of miles. And that's kind of, there's, it's called a spreading center where, where this rift runs along the middle of the ocean and, and, uh, magma kind of like continuously comes up, uh, and it goes either east or west, kind of like this, uh, never stopping conveyor belt. And, and, you know, incrementally just a few, few inches a year, the, the Atlantic ocean gets a little wider and a little wider and, you know, and, and those continents, the European continent, North American continent, South America, Africa are slowly getting further and further apart and um so anyway it's just it it's kind of the one of the cool things about geology and those like volcanism and all that kind of stuff is really kind of what got me interested in this subject to start with yeah it is fascinating now i'm sure there's probably someone out there who would say wait iceland mid-atlantic ridge and a lot of volcanic activity therefore atlantis right is that a theory Wrong. that yeah, but is that a theory that we've seen yet? Has anyone tried to propose that the fabled lost sunken continent might actually be Iceland? <laughs> I hadn't heard that one. That's, I would say probably not, because it's pretty far from the Pillars of Hercules, I would say. I would say so. Yeah, I've been looking for a long time. I hadn't found Atlantis. I'm starting to think it might not actually be out there. It never was, in fact. <laughs> I think the most intriguing theory I ever heard about that, uh, that actually 
could be, you know, if there was any grain of truth to the to the legend, would be the Azores. Oh yeah, and you know that's part of the reason I went to the Azores. And there's some interesting mm-hmm. stuff there, but again, I don't think that it constitutes what we read about in the writings of the great philosopher. But in other writings that we've read recently, you know, Jason, I know you've been keeping up with things happening in the news. I am a little dismayed to see one of your stories here that has to do with a place that you and I have visited in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Track Rock Gap in uh, Georgia was a site that we had the privilege to go to just a couple <clears throat> years ago. And if you go back in the archives and listen to some of those earlier shows, you'll hear us talking about it. It was part of a, a big southern road trip that we did when we went down to Moundville, Alabama, uh, Oak Mulgee down there in Georgia, but this was the, where we started off the trip, uh, even before we picked up uh, Brother James. But yeah, Track Rock Gap, uh, unfortunately, um, and we'll touch more on this in just a second, uh, has been vandalized and being reported in USA Today by Christine Fernando says, irreplaceable thousand-year-old Native American rock carvings vandalized in Georgia's Chattahoochee National Forest. Now, uh, if you haven't been to this site, these petroglyphs and and carvings are basically on large kind of slab boulders and most of them are not in their original position they've essentially sort of just been shoved to the side of the road as expansion and construction have happened over the years but guys if you remember uh, Mike I know you and I specifically talked about this as we were standing there at the site a couple years ago do you recall what we said as we were standing there looking at that big boulder with all of the petroglyphs on it we said this needs to be what Well, yeah, there needed to be a shelter built over it to protect it from, again, the elements, but other things too. And also there's really, I mean, there is sort of like a little fence around it, but that doesn't prevent people from going over there and stomping all over it or, you know, perhaps doing worse. Yeah. And in fact, you know, there's just a little sort of wooden picket fence type thing that's there. At least it was when we were there. Um, There's no protection of it. There's no shelter or anything above it, keeping the rain and other elements off of the, uh, off of the, uh, actual slabs and we have seen over the years uh erosion that's beginning to happen and every year these these petroglyphs are getting lighter and lighter and harder and harder to interpret but the actual damage that's been done this time around included uh according to the u.s forest service included both paint uh but unfortunately the worst of it was some very deep um surface scratching they scratch these big uh, thick sort of squares around some of the portions and i don't know that they can be repaired. Obviously, some of the uh, the uh, damage looks pretty significant. And mm. so, uh, you know, I, I think this is a call to action. A lot of these sites really do need to be protected, and particularly this one that's literally right on the side of a major highway. Um, I think at a minimum, there's uh, at least some sort of protection that should be put into place for sites like this. And it, it doesn't have to be anything expensive or anything um, too, you know, in-depth, but it needs something to kind of protect it from this happening again. Yeah, so I haven't been there, but if I remember correctly, the the stone or the rock that that's carved in, those petroglyphs carved into is soapstone. If that's the case, soapstone is really soft. I mean, not only does it weather really quickly, um, it's really easy to damage. Am I remembering that right, guys? I'm not sure if the track rock petroglyphs are soapstone. Now, Judicola Rock nearby, well, that's what I'm it's not really that close, but I mean, a couple of hours away. We Jason and I kind of did, did this marathon trip where we hit all these petroglyph sites in a single day. Uh, yeah, Judicola is definitely soapstone. I'm not sure uh, about the track rock petroglyphs, but okay. I, I will add this, <clears throat> though. I will certainly add this. Jason, when you're talking about those squarish carvings, you know what that sounds like, right? What's that? Well, it sounds like somebody was trying to remove some of those petroglyphs is what it was. And in fact, there had already been vandalism of that site uh, prior to the uh, turn of the, you know, the 19th into the 20th century. James Mooney, when he actually documented that site and drawings of this appear in his book, Myths of the Cherokee, he had actually documented the fact that there were petroglyph carvings that were removed from some of those stones at Track Rock Gap. So, and indeed... That's what people, you know, these looters will typically do is they will go in and they will carve, you know, a square shape around the portion that they intend to remove. So it sounds like some jerks went in there at night and probably tried to actually cut away portions and remove those. So this is looting. It's not even just vandalism. It was probably intentional looting, which they weren't able to complete and they abandoned. They aborted the mission, you know, midway. But what we're left with, of course, is the potential destruction. It's not potential. It is the destruction of a potentially irreplaceable, you know, 
set of petroglyphs that have not been protected already. And again, you know, leaving them out there by the side of the road, exposed to the elements, exposed to water erosion, because again, the hill that they sit on, you know, again, they're sitting at the base of a hill where water erosion naturally is going to bring them down. And Jason, we saw this too, you know, mud and a lot of you know, little little sandy deposits that have been washed down off the hill were filling some of the actual carvings. That's not helping to preserve these things. Although, years ago, with regard to uh, the Judicula carvings, uh, you know, I'd spoken to some folks on the Cherokee Reservation in Western North Carolina, and they had said, in our opinion, sometimes the best thing that can happen is if the, if this you know the earth comes down and it covers these sites and they are protected by the earth because a uh, then they aren't destroyed by wind and they aren't destroyed by, you know, everything else. And people, you know, the most destructive force in all of nature. Indeed, Earth will protect these things. And, you know, it's our traditional belief, but we also think that these sites should be protected. And maybe the Earth is the best way to do it. So, again, there are a variety of opinions, but it just troubles me to no end. You guys know how passionate I get about this. The destruction of indigenous American archaeological sites, whether it's, you know, petroglyphs that have been moved to a location like the track rock petroglyphs or it's you know anything else i mean i hate to see us losing information about the past that could and should be protected and preserved yeah so they're not wrong about the earth kind of coming over that's the best way to protect it you know that reminds me of there used to be this road trip stop for geology that we used to make in southeast oklahoma and there was a road cut uh and up in this road cut you know i don't know it's probably 50 feet up. It was pretty tough to get up to. There was a, an entire petrified stump. It was a couple of feet across and it was a couple of feet high and it was really cool. And, uh, it was, it was actually in the town that I went to high school in, but when I went, when I lived there, I didn't even know it was there. I had later on, as I went to college, I found out about the stuff. Well, anyway, I was, was down there one day, uh, it's been several years ago and I stopped by there. Uh, I wanted to go see this, uh, stump and show it to somebody. I went up there, somebody stole it. Are you kidding? They some, and it wasn't one person because this thing, one person couldn't pick this, you know, dig this thing out. But somebody stole it. It's not there anymore. I thought, you know. Yeah, and it's nothing new. You know, what we're talking about here with Track Rock Gap, other things. This has been happening out west, too, over the past year. There's been reports coming from uh, National Park Service and other other entities, other government entities reporting that many of the western sites have been, you know, vandalized. And oftentimes when you see the photographs, guys, it's not even like, you know, it's just somebody's initials or some jerk who went out there and and spray painted, you know, Jason was here in 20. 19 or whatever you know it's just always something completely ridiculous and um you know there are people who can do art restoration and things like that to go and try to remove that but again to some degree you're damaging it and you know it's just it's absolutely uncalled for and ridiculous but it keeps happening over and over again every year we get these reports of of damage to these these irreplaceable sites all across the world really indeed yeah that always troubles me especially about sites that we've actually visited and of course It's important to preserve the past. I'll tell you, a guy whose site we have visited and, of course, who also helps to preserve the past is Chase Pipes over there, our friend at the Smoky Mountain Relic Room. Chase is always doing an incredible job, a remarkable job, in fact, collecting information about the past, also collecting important historical items and making those available to the public in ways that are both ethically and also affordably made available to people so that they can learn and they can get involved in learning about history in the past. That's one reason we love hanging out with Chase. What's Chase been up to recently, Jason? Well, you know, he's never still for too long, and he's just getting back to Tennessee from a uh, big west trip. As usual, he's always heading out that way uh, to collect uh, minerals and fossils and all sorts of wonderful things for the uh, shop. So he's just gotten back and getting settled back in. Uh, Also, the Uh, expansion of the shop has now officially been completed as far as i know it's doubled in size so they've really been able to put out a lot more of the minerals a lot more of the crystals and things that people love so much about going to the uh, shop that side of the store is much much bigger than than it was previously and uh, there's plenty more material for you to go there and check out so in addition to the uh, recent uh, militaria collection that he was able to get in he has just also gotten a huge shipment of one of my favorites the megalodon teeth So, uh, yeah, coming from the coast back up into Tennessee, we have a big old shipment of uh, all sizes and shapes and conditions of Megalodon teeth. So feel free to swing by the store there. That's on the uh, French Broad River, or you can always shop online at therelicroom.com. 
of course, the educational arm of uh, Chasing History, which is the uh, Chasing History radio podcast, has uh, several new episodes out uh, on there. They're discussing something, Micah, that you might find of interest, which is some of the lesser known communities in and around the Smoky Mountain National Park. Now, I listened to this episode, and being that's one of my favorite places to visit as I'm going there next month, um, most of these communities I had never heard of, um, and it seems that they are little secret areas of the, the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. And so it was really interesting to me uh, because I'm heading there again myself here very shortly. Uh, he's also got four new episodes out about being on the road, and uh, this time the trip took them to um, recover something that you were just talking about, James, a big portion of a petrified forest. So this is really fascinating. Uh, what they were finding out there is absolutely incredible. These crystallized, petrified uh, logs and portions of trees. It was absolutely incredible. And you can uh, also see that uh, sort of documented over on the Chasing History YouTube channel. And all of that is available through the Chasing History radio podcast, as well as the Chasing History YouTube channel. And again, we always thank Chase and the Smoky Mountain Relic Room for sponsoring the show, the largest diversity of history for sale in North America. Those guys are great. Chase is fantastic. We really appreciate him. He really supports our work, and we support him too. And Jason, you know... I may have to just get over there with you when you're in the Smoky Mountains. Maybe we can even get him to join us, too, and catch up. I always love getting over there, and although time is something of a consideration, and, you know, after the last several months of being stuck inside, I'm getting back out, and I'm performing as a musician, you know, in addition to all the work that I do from home. So uh, part of the reason I'm busier than ever is because I've actually gone back to doing a lot of my older line of work. But, you know, it is wonderful to be able to get out and to be able to see people. You know, I'm now among the ranks of those who have been fully vaccinated. And it's interesting and it feels almost surreal to be able to feel a sense of normalcy after all of this, you know, the last several months of strangeness that we've all lived through. And I am very thankful for that and the opportunities that I hope that will exist, not just for the team and for our associates, you know, the wider network of the research associates, but also for all of you guys out there who listen, all of our friends, especially in the archaeology community, who've had to weather this storm. And indeed, helping us weather this storm, there are a few names I do want to mention here, because a lot of you guys, like Chase, who sponsors this program, have supported us in other ways, too. Like, for instance... Edith Wacker, my friend, who sent along $100, and she had said, you know, although we live a fair distance apart and we can't get together and talk philosophy, I can at least help send you on the road in pursuit of answers about the past. So Edith, who sent along a very generous $100 donation, thank you, Edith. Ladies and gents at home, it's people like Edith who support our work and who are doing like Chase does, and helping us to further our efforts to educate the public, to raise awareness about problems like what we saw at Track Rock Gap recently with the looting issue going on down there, and above all else, getting people interested in archaeology and history. So thank you, Edith. You are my friend, and I appreciate you very much. Also, Brian Marshall, right on the heels of Edith's donation, he sent along $50. Brian Marshall, wherever you are, Thank you very much for your generosity as well. And then, of course, the ongoing donations of our good pal, who I heard from just yesterday morning, George Howard. He actually sent me a text. George, brother, we are always thinking about you. And he never fails to send along $20 every single month. He is a great guy. And Christina Frawley, also with her $10 donation monthly. These people who subscribe and provide this ongoing support of our efforts, that means the world to us. And indeed, we hope that through our efforts... In whatever little way that we can, we can also contribute to the broader knowledge that we all share about history. That's very important. So thanks to all you guys who have supported the program. If you'd like to do likewise, those of you listening at home, we have a donation button right there at 7ages.org that you too can use to contribute to our efforts. And where that money goes, we'll tell you right now, that all goes toward our efforts to get out there on the road or to volunteer on archaeology projects. We haven't been able to do that in a while. Not sure when the next one will be, but in the eventual sense, we do all hope to get back out there on the road and to lend our blood, sweat, and tears, maybe pick up a shovel, maybe pick up a camera and document things happening at archaeology sites. A lot of ways that we contribute, but that helps fund those efforts all in the furtherance of expanding our collective knowledge of history. So thanks to all you guys. And one other way that a lot of people show support for the program is they send us information, they email us. Some of them also take to 
Apple Podcasts or their favorite podcasting app, and they leave reviews. And I think we've got a few new reviews too, don't we, Jason? Yeah, we sure do. And uh, again, this is a wonderful way to help support the show. The reviews are very important to uh, getting the show up higher in the uh, the algorithm so that other people can find the content that we're putting out. So uh, yeah, I want to highlight a couple of them here this uh, month. Ursula Unity writes, fantastic. Hosted by a trio of intelligent, hardworking gentlemen who have hands-on experience in the field, this podcast combines expert guests with fully researched interview questions and comments. Adding to this, the conversations are examples of civic public discourse, something sadly lacking in many forms of media today. I have diligently searched for a podcast that focuses on ancient America, particularly in what is now the southeastern United States. I have often been disappointed by content that descends into wild speculation. Thanks to all who helped create this show. So Ursula, we again appreciate that. It's a fantastic review. Uh, We also have a a second review from a friend, Mo Digger, who follows us online. So we appreciate that. And then we'll close it out with uh, Jessup231, who says, Get ready to learn. Seven Ages Audio Journal is bridging the gap between professional and avocational archaeologists. Wonderful stories and great insight into the past and the various approaches to uncovering more clues buried just beneath our feet. So again, thanks to all who took the time to leave those reviews. Again, they are very important. And uh, if anyone else would like to do so, we would uh, be happy to highlight those on the next episode. Indeed. And thanks to all of you who took time to leave those. And, you know, to Ursula's point, you know, not only are there those podcasts that descend into the wild speculation, but then there are also a lot of these podcasts that even when there is ample evidence in support of emerging new ideas in American archaeology or archaeology around the world, there are some podcasts that just make folly of it. And frankly, they may even be hosted by professionals who, in my humble opinion, don't always act professionally and don't always bring a level of rigor and merit to the conversation that it deserves. So I really think it's very important for us to have conversations about the topics we all enjoy, but really to do our due diligence to raise good questions for our guests, offer them the opportunity to come on and actually discuss their work. And again, we exclusively, I mean, we may not always have, you know, PhD professors, but we always have professionals on this program in their disciplines. The majority of our guests are not only PhD professionals, but frankly, some of the most legendary, you know, living archaeologists in the world today. We're very proud of that, and we think it's very important that we raise the bar on the dialogue as avocationalists ourselves. We are people who grew up reading about the work of these individuals. It is our honor, privilege, and pleasure to be able to highlight their work every time we do one of these podcasts. So, thank you, Ursula. Thanks to all you guys who left those reviews, and please consider doing so yourself. If you out there enjoy this program, leave us a review. You can also tell your friends about this program, share it on social media. And don't forget, if you'd like to follow us on social media, you can find us on Twitter. You can find us on our YouTube channel, and you can also find us on Instagram. All of those and the ways to follow us can be found at sevenages.org or just go online, look for Seven Ages Research Associates on the relevant platforms. You'll be sure and find us. All right, guys. Well, with all that out of the way, we have quite a discussion in store this time around because we are about to go deep into the great mystery, one of history's greatest mysteries involving the lost colony of Roanoke. That awaits when we return right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. The year was 1584, and Sir Walter Raleigh was deep into explorations of the islands along the coast of the New World. These islands, recognized as the outer banks of modern-day North Carolina, seemed like a promising locale for the establishment of permanent trading posts, an object Raleigh would have sought to secure had it not been for conflict with the local indigenous Americans residing there. Thus, in 1585, when English colonists arrived on Roanoke Island in modern-day Dare County, North Carolina, they attempted to establish what would have been the first permanent English colony in North America. The establishment of a permanent colony was more than just an attempt for the English to establish an outpost for trade. It sought to further efforts toward laying the foundation for a lasting presence in the New World. Following in the footsteps of Humphrey Gilbert's claim of St. John's, Newfoundland, two years earlier in 1583, the 1585 colony was founded under Governor Ralph Lane. 
although the early attempt at establishing a settlement by Raleigh proved to be short-lived. Governor Lane's colony soon began to flounder on account of dwindling resources, and being further aggravated by confrontations with the natives, his abandonment and return to England with Francis Drake the following year had been almost unavoidable. Just weeks later, a single supply ship, followed days later by the entire fleet of Richard Grenville, who had made the trip back to England for supplies for the colony, arrived to discover the abandoned site. No trace of the original colony could be found at that time, and in an effort to guard Raleigh's claim, Grenville left a modest detachment of men behind to secure the locale. Soon afterward, an alliance of mainland tribes attacked the men left behind by Grenville. Armed with flaming arrows, the makeshift houses and food stores Grenville's men had built were burned. Although indigenous Croatan accounts of the incident tell that several of the men escaped and continued to Port Ferdinando, the thirteen survivors of the attack had vanished by the time their fellow Englishmen returned. None were ever seen again. Raleigh, undeterred, would begin renewed attempts at founding a permanent colony. In January 1587, a corporate charter was approved by Raleigh for the founding of the City of Raleigh. A new wave of approximately 115 settlers arrived on the islands, and under the governance of John White, made a renewed attempt to colonize Raleigh's original site. Upon their arrival, White's party located the site of Lane's colony, where they found the remains of the fortification destroyed during the attack on Grenville's men. Human bones were also found among the ruined site. As White investigated the circumstances, he learned from the Croatan that mainland tribes were the groups who led the attack on Granville's men who remained behind. A truce was attempted by the English with the mainland groups, relying on the friendly Croatan as intermediaries, but to no avail. Conflict continued throughout the year, well into the summer months. Among the colonists who arrived at the beginning of the year had been White's daughter Eleanor and her husband, Ananias Dare, who would give birth to their daughter Virginia on August 18, 1587, the first English child to be born in the New World. Shortly after the birth of Virginia, the colonists made the decision to relocate the colony to a new location 50 miles north along Albemarle Sound, on account of growing tensions in the area. Before the end of August, Governor White was eventually convinced to return to England and to try to seek additional help for the colonists. The return trip to England was long and difficult. More than a month later in the first days of November, White reached his homeland only to find that Queen Elizabeth had forbidden any ships from departing England on account of reports of a forthcoming attack by the Spanish Armada. After many weeks, which eventually dragged on into months, White was finally granted the use of two small ships from Richard Granville's fleet, the Row and the Brave, back to the New World on account of the fact that they had been regarded as unfit for battle. The following spring, White set sail at last in the final days of April, only to be further impeded by confrontations with Spanish ships and attacks by French pirates as they sailed near Morocco, resulting in the deaths of many crew members. Supplies that were to be carried on to the desperate colonists in the New World were also looted. Altogether, White was unable to make a renewed attempt at bringing supplies to his colonists until 1590. During White's separation from the colony, rumors about the English settlement had begun to circulate in his absence. The Spanish had begun to believe that it was, in essence, a base for piracy, while other rumors told that the English had located a mountain comprised entirely of diamonds further inland on the continent. At some point in 1587, King Philip II of Spain sent Vincente González to Chesapeake Bay and on his way back from this Spanish reconnaissance mission he sailed past the Outer Banks. Gonzalez reportedly saw no signs of activity, colonists or otherwise, on Roanoke Island at this time, although he only spent little time in the vicinity. Despite this, the Spanish were convinced of the discovery by Gonzalez of the suspected secret base established by the British, which might have been attacked by Spain had it not been for the defeat of the Spanish Armada across the Atlantic. As White made his return trip in 1590, a fleet of six ships carried White first on a privateering expedition against Spanish outposts in the Caribbean, two of which, the flagship Hopewell and the Moonlight, finally broke away and carried Raleigh north to the location of his colony. Upon reaching Roanoke Island, plumes of smoke were spotted on several occasions and investigations followed, but with no discovery of the colonists. During attempts at crossing Pamlico Sound, several of White's men were killed, and by August 17th, when they arrived at the northernmost end of Roanoke, Night was falling already, and they chose not to venture onto the island, fearing an attack. Anchored a distance away in their boats, 
White and his men sang folk songs, hoping their English friends might be on land nearby and able to hear them. Finally, on the morning of August 18th, White and his crew made landfall on Roanoke. They felt promise at the sight of fresh human footprints in the sand, although they found no bodies that left them. Making their way inland, one of White's crew observed the letters C.R.O. carved into a tree. Upon finally reaching the site of the colony, a wooden palisade was observed which had not been erected at the time of his departure. There, near the entrance to the fenced area on one of the palisade's posts, the word Croatoan had been carved. Prior to his departure in 1587, it had been agreed upon that the colonists would leave behind a secret token if they were to choose to leave, which would leave White and his crew an indication as to what their destination had been. Thus, White believed this to have been the token, and that his colony had relocated to Croatoan Island, and with any luck, would still be found there. No other signs of the colonists could be found at this site, which further bolstered the notion that they had moved to a safer location. Aboard the Hopewell later that evening, plans were made to return to Croatoan the following day. However, as with White's misfortunes after his return to England, calamity began to ensue with the ship's anchor cable breaking, which left the vessel in the precarious position of having only one working cable and anchor, thus placing them at risk of shipwreck. It was not a chance they could take, and thus the search mission could not continue. The moonlight set sail for England, while the Hopewell sought to weather the winter months in the Caribbean and return to the Outer Banks again the following spring. However, this plan was also disrupted when winds blew them off course and they ended up in the Azores, where further turbulent weather prevented them from even making landfall. Thus, the Hopewell changed course entirely for England, where it arrived on October 24th, 1590. To this day, the fate of the more than 100 lost colonists remains one of history's greatest mysteries. Among the speculations about their fate have been such ideas as their assimilation among various indigenous American groups, an idea which had been written and discussed as early as 1605. Other stories told that the colonists were killed by hostile mainland tribes, or perhaps also taken hostage. However, compelling stories of natives bearing European features persisted as well suggesting that some of the English who went missing during the colonization attempts might indeed have been assimilated into the local tribes. To date, no conclusive evidence in support of any of the theories has been produced, and archaeologists continue to work to try and uncover answers to the great riddle of the lost colony. You know, the mystery of the lost colony of Roanoke is one of those things that takes me back to my childhood. Um, one of the very first times I heard about the story was on the old Leonard Nimoy show In Search Of. Uh, they had an episode called The Lost Colony of Roanoke that aired uh, October 25th, 1979. Now, granted, I was two years old at this time, but all through the 80s, they used to replay in syndication in search of, and it was a show I was obsessed with. I absolutely loved watching it, and I specifically remember that episode. And so I went and looked up some of the uh, the details of that episode. And uh, sure enough, it's funny that even though it aired at the time back in 1979, the tagline was a look at new evidence which offers an intriguing theory about where the colonists of the ill-fated Roanoke colony went. So even in 1979, they were continuing to pursue that mystery and present new clues. Uh, new evidence as they go along, much like we're going to do here tonight. We're going to talk about more of the uh, progression of tracking down what could have possibly happened to this colony. But uh, again, you know, it was that time period, the late 70s, 80s, as we really began to explore some of these classic American mysteries a little bit deeper that Roanoke really solidified itself for me as a, a true American mystery. And again, being from South Carolina, not too far removed from where this all happened. Um, you know, it was always a place that I wanted to go visit. And, and you know, eventually I did have the opportunity to make it out to that uh, area of North Carolina to learn more about the mystery. But uh, Mike, I understand you've also had an opportunity uh, in recent years to get out there and take a look yourself. Yes, I have. I've actually been out to the Outer Banks. I had a friend who actually took me and showed me a tree 
that appears to have, you know, carved letters in it very similar to what's even described in that historical narrative. And, you know, going there, I mean, I couldn't help but think what this must have been like, how hard this way of life must have been. Let's keep in mind that the original detachment that Grenville left behind prior to Raleigh's second attempt at establishing a colony, I mean, they vanished too. They were attacked and no one knows what happened to them. But I mean, one can easily imagine what probably happened. And so what's really interesting to me and always has been interesting is that there were actually several sort of little scattered lost colonies in a sense. And uh, that kind of contributes to the mystery. But yeah, going out there, I was actually with some of the archaeologists who have performed work there. They remain as fascinated with this. And even since we began Seven Ages, getting to know Charlie Ewan and a few others, I mean, we have continued to meet archaeologists and uh, people who have been very involved with the research effort to try and finally come to a resolution about this longstanding historical mystery. Yeah, you know, you might be able to even say that this may be the first American mystery. And, and you know, not to make light of this, but, I, you know, this is kind of a, a serious thing, uh, kind of a serious question. But another mysterious thing about this is how could anybody convince their wife to get on a ship and go across the ocean and colonize a new continent? I mean, that's, that's a pretty hard sell. Well, it's think. not unlike something that Jesse Halligan actually mentioned on the show a while back where she had said that she and we actually – clipped this audio soundbite and featured this on our Clovis Enigma episode, but she was saying that, you know, she and our good friend Shane Miller kind of agree to disagree about the peopling of the Americas. And she raised a very similar argument, James. She said, as a woman, I can only imagine what mothers might have been thinking when faced with the prospect of having to try and cross the land bridge carrying children across a land bridge if we had boats available. Now, maybe the boats would make that journey a little more appealing at least, but still, you think about scurvy, you think about heat, you think about, I mean, the, the weather that you are met with. It wasn't a pleasant experience having to sail no. across the ocean. I mean, yet again, look at the situation with John White. He finally makes his way back to the New World, and they're going to have to go all the way to the Caribbean to weather the winter months and get blown off course, end up in the Azores, can't land because the weather's so bad, and have to go all the way back to England. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is not a <laughs> carnival cruise. No, not this at is all. like open air living on a ship exposed to the elements. I mean, what are you eating? Like, you know, salted meat and, you know, you don't have fresh water to drink. You're probably drinking beer or, you know, whatever yeah. else that they take that doesn't go bad. I mean, it's a, man, it's rough. Yeah, well, you know, having spent six years at sea myself, I can certainly attest to the fact that uh, even in modern times, it can certainly be rough, uh, to say the least. So I can only uh, imagine what it would have been like back then. Uh, but yeah, you know, the lost colony of Roanoke, it's one of those enduring mysteries. And we're going to get into uh, some of the fine details of the latest research tonight. Yeah, we certainly are. And one thing that I'll bring up here briefly that's always interested me uh, has to do with the Zuniga map. Are you guys familiar with that? Yes. Yeah, this is the element where, here's the backstory, basically. In 1607, when John Smith ends up being captured by the Powhatan, and he met with their leader and his brother. Now, generally, people refer to him as Chief Powhatan, and here's why, because his actual name was Wahun Seneca. But the leader and his brother basically described to John Smith a place that they called Okanahonan, where they said that there were men who wore European-style clothing, and built homes with walls, kind of like how English constructions were built. So there was a map made of this. The original doesn't still exist, but it was included with a letter that Smith sent back to England, and a copy of the map was obtained by Pedro de Zuniga, the Spanish ambassador to England. And then he sent that copy to King Philip III of Spain. The Zuniga map still exists, as I understand it. It was rediscovered in 1890. And again, it shows the map that was drawn purportedly tracing the path to this area where the Powhatan people had told John Smith, yeah, that's where you're going to find, you know, people who dress like you do and who build homes like you do. So there are some tantalizing historical clues, in my opinion, that do suggest that the colonists probably did assimilate with some of the local indigenous groups. And that certainly is a possibility. But of course, I guess that as far as archaeology can be applied to this, the current efforts, the new evidence like you were talking about, Jason, which we've been continuing to hear about for decades now, there's always something new coming out. 
Really, it seems like the best that archaeology can try to hope to do is find the original site and to try and document what might have happened there and see if there's any information that can be gleaned from that site that will aid us in knowing what eventually happen to the colonists, but really I'm afraid that this historical mystery will probably remain one. I don't know that we'll ever have a full account of what happened to the colonists, where they went, and what their ultimate fate had been. But when we come back right after this, we are going to be joined by Philip Evans, who is going to provide us the latest details on the First Colony Foundation, an organization that he is a part of, and their current efforts to try and unravel the mystery of the lost colony. We will talk with Philip Evans when we return here in a moment on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Continuing our conversation about one of those enduring mysteries, not only of the Carolinas, but really of the Americas in general. That's right, the lost colony of Roanoke. And joining us right now is Mr. Philip W. Evans. He is an attorney in private practice concentrating on juvenile and mental health law in Durham, North Carolina. Previously, he was a park ranger and historian at the Fort Raleigh National Historic Site, where he received the Freeman Tilden Award for Education and Interpretation from the National Parks and Conservation Association. But of course, he has joined us today to talk about our mutual interest. Uh, Phil, how are you? I'm fine. Doing pretty well. It's been a long day, but it's I don't know where you are, but it's dark and it's evening, early evening here. Yes, indeed. Yeah, all the days seem to be longer these days, do they not? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Well, Phil, thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, We are just picking up on the newest information surrounding the mystery of the lost colony of Roanoke, that 115 people that mysteriously disappeared uh, so long ago in the 1500s. Now, we've seen... uh, A lot of information come out over the last few years, but specifically the work that you're doing with the First Colony Foundation is being held uh, throughout the media through many different articles as solving the mystery. So we want to get into that a little bit tonight and find out exactly what it is uh, that the First Colony Foundation is all about. What is the focus and goal of the foundation and uh, how does it work as far as uh, solving the mystery of Roanoke? Well, the First Colony Foundation is a North Carolina pro- nonprofit that uh, was created in about 2005. I think that's the first time we went in the field to explore uh, all aspects relating to Sir Walter Raleigh's voyages and colonies under his 1584 charter from Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, there were several voyages, not just the one that it ended up being creating the lost colony, and so we're interested in all of those. We're called the First Colony Foundation, I think, because we were actually originally as interested or more interested in an, the first colony that Roanoke Island, which was the one from 1585 to 1586. But there were voyages in 1584 up through 1590. We're interested in all of that. We're interested in, of course, what little what led up to that, what followed that, uh, in, in searches and interest in the colonies, and of course, huge interest, big interest in the natives who were already here when the English sailed across the Atlantic to North America. They were already here with their towns and their culture and their populations. We're interested in that other side of the coin. Uh, it's not just the English side of the coin. That's that certainly doesn't tell you the whole story. It doesn't even tell you half the story. As we look at the the foundation's goals. So the First Colony Foundation, you being the president, uh, before we get into the newest discoveries, those that are being discussed in the media currently, uh, I want to begin with your initial investigation. So up to this point, prior to finding the latest discoveries, what is it that the First Colony Foundation was doing as far as your general research? How are you trying to hone in on the evidence? Well, Myself a little bit, and particularly our leading archaeologist, worked with a renowned American historical archaeologist named Ivor Noel Hume out of Colonial Williamsburg. And Noel Hume came to Roanoke Island in the early 1990s to investigate uh, some archaeological features accidentally found by the Park Service in 1965. And I had done some historical research on them. And and had some ideas as to what those finds were. And I contacted Noel, as he's known. Ivor Noel Hume is often called Noel uh, by people who know him anyway. I was, 
Uh, he's passed now, but he was a great, famous American historical archaeologist, renowned all through the country. Uh, but anyway, and so Noel came and looked at the artifacts, and he began to think, get some ideas as to uh, what they might represent, and convinced the National Park Service to allow him and some of the people who are the leaders of the First Colony Foundation, our leading archaeologists, to go do some excavations at Fort Raleigh on Roanoke Island. Ra Fort Raleigh on Roanoke Island is the National Park Service site dedicated to the Roanoke Colony story. It's where the outdoor drama of the Lost Colony is performed. It's where an Earthworks Fort was reconstructed in the, about 1950 that's, as we believe, associated with the colony. A lot of artifacts were found. But these artifacts that Noel was interested in, he believed were evidence of scientific testing in 1585 and 1586 under the direction of an English polymath named Thomas Harriet and a Jewish metallurgist, the first documented practicing Jew in America named Joachim Gans from Prague in Czechoslovakia. So he excavated and all of that brought together this talent pool that uh, to excavate what Noel decided was or interpreted as the America's First Science Center. Well, that after that work was done, things went quiet for a while, and Noel left, uh, left any field work. But these other archaeologists who had been mentored by him felt that we, more work could, should be done at Roanoke Island and we should continue to do archaeological work. So they actually turned to me and said, can you help us put together an organization? And that's what I did. We put together the First Colony Foundation. We raised some money. We made some plans. And we, up until about 2010, we were focused on archaeological work at Roanoke Island. We'd like to, we're going to hope to go back there, too. We have plans to go back there. But all the focus was at Roanoke Island until 2010. Then some things happened. Well, let's get into some of that. I know that there have been some some issues, and it's been uh, complex at times. Uh, no less among these issues, of course, the current coronavirus pandemic. Uh, what kind of challenges have you guys faced uh, since 2010 and even before then in terms of continuing the research there? Well, we're a nonprofit. We're not a state government agency. Everything we do is through donations and volunteers. Our budget, we do not have any paid employees. There is no paid employee of the First Colony Foundation. We don't have an executive director. I think I do that job some of the time, most of the time. Uh, so we we try to stretch the dollars we're donated. And so keeping up funding without a large endowment or without government support, as we're not a government agency, as I said, that's the number one challenge. And And the other great challenge in archaeology is access to sites. Um, in 2010, we were asked to uh, consider looking for a Native American village, a Native village famous in the John White watercolors, if you've ever seen those, an open village plan of a town called Sikatan. And some of the people on the Pamlico Sound, Pamlico River of North Carolina, thought, well, maybe we could go find that town and it would be interesting and, and exciting to see if we could find that town. So they asked us to go looking for it, uh, at least study the the possibilities of finding Sikatan. Well, there were problems with funding and problems with access. That's the two things archaeologists have to have. You have to have some level of funding because not everything can be done with volunteers, and you have to have access to good ar potential archaeological sites. If sure. landowners don't let you go there, then there's not, but not much you can do. Mm -hmm. uh, that led us to uh, try to focus on where the specific, where the most most uh, valuable targets were in looking for Sikatan, that got us into a detailed map analysis. We one of our map analysis, part of that map analysis was what archaeologists do. This is part of the process. You look and see where are the soils, where are the environmental conditions that allow the natives to grow the crops that were necessary, essential for their survival. Where is the, Where are the fisheries? Where are the hunting areas? Where do they have to be to live? In addition to that, you always go back and look at what are any other earlier archaeological site reports? What have people collected and turned in? What have archaeological surveys shown? 
And we were in the process of doing that and looking at maps and also looking at the historical maps, most importantly, the ones created by Sir Walter Raleigh's colonies in the 1580s. Yeah, picking up on the, the idea of the maps and how important they are to this story, uh, again, when you're you're trying to tackle something from the 1500s and there's very little to base that, that information off of, maps become a central focus for your research. And it was one of those maps that helped kind of break the case open, if you will, uh, that map belonging to John White, who is a key figure who we've already discussed in the story up to this point. So tell us about that John White map and exactly how it was discovered with the information and how it played into the story. Well, the map, the map that uh, you're talking about is a watercolor, we believe, created or created by John White. We'll hear talk more about him probably later. But it runs from about Cape Charles, um, Virginia, on the north side of the Hampton Roads, Chesapeake Bay, uh, entrance to the Chesapeake Bay, down to Cape Lookout, North Carolina. And about 100 miles from the ocean to the inland from there. And it's a watercolor map, very detailed, beautiful map, very interesting. And it shows this Secatan and Roanoke Island and all these other little places that the English visited and recorded that there were Indian towns. Well, we were very interested in particularly in the area around the Pamlico because there, there seemed to be some kind of Odd things happening there. A piece of paper had been glued to it. There seemed to have been some redrawing or something. So one of our, our board one of our board members at the time, a fellow named Brent Lane, made contact with the British Museum in London. the 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 map is it is actually not considered a map. They call it a drawing. It's not in the map collection of the British Library. It's in the drawings collection of the British Museum. But uh, they looked at it. They were willing. They were convinced to look at it. Uh, by Brent, and they took it and basically put it on a light table or a light box. And it's hard to describe what happened, but a, a image popped up, just really popped up on this map. Shocking, surprising. One of our historians said it's maybe the best clue as to what happened to the Lost Colony in the in 400 years. What happened is that the, someone had painted on the surface of the original map a blue and red colored symbol of a Renaissance fort. Now, and then they had covered it over with another little piece of paper, kind of glued a piece of paper on top of it so you didn't see it until it was put on this light box and it's almost projected through. It's projected through boldly. Once it's uh, once it's the light comes from behind, but looking at it on the surface, no one ever saw it. Now this gets even more interesting. W- one of our archaeologists, our expert on the are uh, on the Al- Carolina Algonquians, the natives here, suggested if you look at this thing really careful, there's another image on top of the piece of paper. The British Museum did some tests of that as well, and there's another fort image. It's a more detailed fort image. The British Museum has not said how it appear, how it gets there. They talk about it being an invisible ink, but you understand the English enjoy things like James Bond and invisible inks and Sherlock Holmes and stuff like that. But of it's course. there. <laughs> well, now that you now, now that you now that you know it's there and you look at it, you can't miss it. It's one of these things where how come nobody saw it before? Well, nobody thought to look. Yeah. Well, not the kind of thing I guess one naturally expects. What's partially so interesting about this and why it's such a great historical mystery is that while we're trying to understand the archaeological side of things, we do have these historical elements that we can rely on. And from time to time, as this instance would seem to show, Phil, you know, further investigation and in fact reinvestigation of old historical resources sometimes yields new information. That's exactly correct, particularly with old maps, particularly with old maps. And as you talked, both of us talked about earlier with maps, we I spend lots of times with maps, and so do our archaeologists and our historians. In fact, today, you know, we when they mention an Indian town, we want to be able to figure out where it was, what it was. Are they even mentioning a town? Are they describing a creek? We don't know. So maps are hugely important. Analysis of maps, looking at things drawn on maps and and maybe sort of erased or rubbed out. Same thing with the historical documents. Uh, 
we a lot of people have problem. You know, a lot of people have a problem with reading cursive, just normal cursive writing. But 16th century English cursive writing, sometimes called secretary hand, is a whole nother level of complexity. So there, there's a lot of there's a lot of depth, a huge amount of depth. To this this research. Just to be clear, for this map, were the symbols just overlooked on the map, or were were they actually intended to be uh, hidden or obscured in some way? That's part of the mystery. Okay. We don't really know why they covered up the blue red fort with a piece of paper and then put another fort image right on the top of it in something that you can't see with the naked eye. Did they have some way of 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 bringing that image to view? by heat or light or some other chemical. Exactly who covered up the original Fort Patch? We think it happened in the 16th century because it's the same, it's contemporaneous because it's the same paper. But that's a bit of the mystery, exactly what they may have been trying to, and that our, our belief is they may have been trying to conceal plans from prying eyes because the Spanish and the English were at war. The Spanish were, were, were spying on the English. Uh, the English were spying on the Spanish. There are documents in Spain that were uh, uh, stolen from the English. There are documents in English that were stolen from the Spanish. So it was a, a cat and mouse game. Based off the information that we get from the John White map, that leads to something that we have uh, described as Site X and Site Y. So we've kind of touched on that to this point, but what is important to the story as far as these maps go, and what does the archaeologist, uh, what does the archaeology rather tell us about Site X and Site Y? Uh, were they excavated? Were these uh, sites actually found to produce anything that adds to the story? Well, seeing a MIM symbol on the map just tells you, or, or suggests to you, there's something to look at. Focus on this area. What's what? Someone else has already focused on this area, which is at the the area where the Roanoke River in North Carolina met, it joins with the Chowan River uh, in east northeastern North Carolina, and the, and this fort symbol is very close, very much in the in in the in the area where these two rivers flow together, and then they create what's now the Albemarle Sound, which flows about fifty miles east to Roanoke Island. So the question then becomes, okay. If there's this on the map, if the map is showing something here, and we di- and we don't know exa- all about why it's showing it or where or what it is, at least we didn't know that in 2012 when the fort symbol was discovered. What is the archaeological story there? Well, fortunately, one of our leading archaeologists, Nick Lucchetti, Nicholas Lucchetti, had done some archaeological survey in his professional capacity as a professional archaeologist for a big housing development that was going to go in in that very area. Well, it failed. That development failed with the economic downturn in 28, 2008. But Nick had in the back of his mind, he said, look, there's, there's archaeological remains, there's archaeological material, artifact material there in that area. Because he said, I, 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 my, my crew has been there. We've seen it. And some of it, doesn't seem to fit in the standard history. The standard history is that English colonists come to North Carolina in the middle of the 1600s, in the 1650s and 1660s. And Nick says there's stuff there that does not fit that story. And so we went out and fortunately had the good cooperation of a landowner there, a man who owned a sub part of that property, and he was willing and happy to let us go look. We excavated what is now known as Site X, a small site. We don't think there's very many people there, but the ceramic materials and other materials coming out of that site are materials that we believe, or we're, we're convinced, are from the late 16th century, the late 1500s, not the middle 1600s. Uh, both the positive archaeological evidence and the negative archaeological evidence. That's what gives us Site X. Of course, and Nick named it Site X because he thought it sounded cool because we, we did have a better name. 
Yeah, well, you know, that makes sense. X is used for a lot of different things when it comes to uh, the world of uh, mysterious occurrences, if you will. Uh, but, well, let's talk about that for just a second, because you made a very clear distinction between the two time periods. So what is it about the differences between those two time periods that makes you confident in what you're finding at Site X? First, the positive archaeological evidence is the ceramic evidence, the English, the European ceramic evidence. It's evidence that occurs and is found in the early Virginia colonial sites. Virginia, of course, starting in 1607 with Jamestown. Particularly something called Surrey, Hampshire border ware, which is which the the that that's found fairly commonly in the very earliest colonial Virginia uh, sites. But then it drops off. It just basically disappears by about 1625, 1630. It's just. Uh, it's it's like rotary dial telephones, or you know, they just don't you don't see them on on sites after about 1625, 1630. There may be a piece or two, but it's just not prevalent. The other thing that is we we're finding at X and Y is there's no so 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 this these the or let me go back those so the site X is not giving material from the 1660s and 1670s, 1680s, okay? It's giving this earlier, this material that's found earlier in Virginia. Now, the other thing that is clear on er, and colo, early colonial sites, you may have heard this, ubiquitous to early colonial sites, sites is pipe stems, white clay pipe stems. Now, you've probably seen these in movies and pictures and stuff, somebody in colonial America smoking a white clay pipe. And the pipe stems are found everywhere. They're like cigarette butts and bottle caps. They're everywhere. And archaeologists can date those by looking at how big the hole is in the stem of the pipe. The bore of the pipe stem can be measured and and calculated, and you can pretty accurately date a site. Archaeologists do this. I'm not an archaeologist, but I'm trying to explain this to you. They can date a site pretty solidly from pipe stem uh, evidence. Well, if the site, if the site at X or Y was a site prior to 1650, between 1600 and 1650, it would have pipe stems from that period, and they these and we don't have that. We don't have pipe stems from the period. Uh, pre- predating the the um, expected colonization, where you get a different pottery type in the second half of the 1600s. So yes, yeah, so the material remains, in other words, are suggestive, strongly suggestive of different timing of the occupation of this site than what the historical record would seem to entail otherwise. Right, right. The, and also, let's go back to the map evidence. There is no, <clears throat> there is, there are some map evidence of. Englishmen coming into the uh, into the area in the 1660s. Early when the earliest person comes in 1655, his name is Nathaniel Batts. Now he is he is not on this site. His house is shown on the south side of a creek that we, you may hear a lot about or read about called Salmon Creek. And then some of the people are kind of along the shore down towards Roanoke Island. But we have no map evidence of any. A European settler there, uh, even as you know, earlier than oh, maybe 1670, 1675, and we certainly aren't getting artifacts even uh, any, any earlier than that. Most of the artifacts actually at Site Y are more towards 1700. There is a seven, there is an early 18th century component there, and that may be actually be a, a early early African slave uh, quarter. Of course, those diagnostic uh, artifacts are always going to tell us the story, as we well know. Uh, Something else that comes to mind when we're talking about this is, um, as far as the evidence that you're finding, so you're you're basing the mystery being solved off of the pottery, the, the pipe stems, and things of this nature. So when we're actually talking about the headlines that we're seeing in the media, mystery solved for Roanoke, what exactly is the evidence for it being solved? Are we specifically talking about the pottery, or is there something that is so uh, blatant, if you will, that it sort of closes the case on Roanoke? What we are saying is we believe we have evidence that substantiates 
that the colonists, a part of them, a growing number of them, we certainly don't have them all, and we we're, we're, we need to find more. But that the colonists said in 1587 they were going to buy, buy, move 50 miles inland. And we're finding evidence 50 miles inland that colonists moved there. Base, we're basing it on that documentary evidence, also on an early 1600s map from Virginia called the Zuniga map. A map. This is a map. It, the Zuniga map is an English map that was stolen in is in in Spain, and was discovered in the late 1800s in Spain, which shows that there are European colonists. The Jamestown colony believed that there were Europeans surviving right where we're working, where we're focusing. Um, so the documentary evidence, the map evidence, not just the John White map, but also the Zuniga map. Combined with the archaeological evidence is telling us we have, we are beginning to see the, the traces, the, the evidence of European colonists there in the 1590s. Now, there's still plenty of mystery left, okay? And we're, part, we're beginning to think where, what, what, how much more of the mystery is left because it, these artifacts don't tell us the fates of these people. It doesn't answer the story for every colonist. There are a lot more to be found. We hope to continue archaeological work. We're beginning to see, we're beginning to open the door into the how to understand this mystery. But I don't think we contend that the mystery solved, it's over, don't think about it anymore. There's plenty of mystery left. There's a lot more we don't know. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with you on that point. And so I just want to throw this out to you. Based off the information that you guys are finding, and to make it perfectly clear to the listeners, you're not saying that you've solved anything. You're saying that you're gathering information, you're gathering uh, evidence, if you will. Uh, are there opposition, anyone opposing your views at this point, or are you pretty solid in, in what, you're, what you're being able to produce? Well, two things on there. We believe we are solving the, the, the mystery of where they go when they depart Roanoke Island. We believe that we're getting good evidence of that they made good their intention to depart Roanoke Island after John White went back to England in 1587 and to go inland, as they said, told him that they were going to do. Now, how many of them got there? How well they survived? How What happened to them when we got there? Once they got there, we, don't, we, we still have to, to do work to find out. There's a lot more mystery there. Now, as far as there's always question about Something like the Lost Colony, it's so romantic, it's very romanticized, it's very mysterious. People, you know, I can understand people don't really want the mystery to be solved. I'm not sure. Sometimes I do. I think I start when we first started this thing, I wasn't that focused on the, on the Lost Colony, and I don't think the La First Colony Foundation was. We've kind of gotten into this after the map discovery. But I think the mystery is the portal for the public. The mystery draws the people to the history, and that's better, almost better than just solving the mystery. I'd rather people get into the story, learn about Sir Walter Raleigh, learn about Mantio and Juan Cheese, learn about John White, Thomas Harriet, and learn the history. And if the mystery brings them in, I'm perfectly happy with a lot of mystery. You know, when you mentioned that the colonists said that they were going to move 50 miles inland, was there a reason given for that? Is there speculation on that? Does anybody actually know? Well, they mentioned, they said to, that John White says we leave in 1587. He said that the colonists had told him they were going to move into the, into the main presently. And, of course, the reason for that is the interior, the mainland areas are agriculturally far superior to the coastal sandy coastal beaches of the Outer Banks. The Outer Banks is a great place to vacation, but it's the beach, and you can't farm, and you can't grow things, and you can't develop a population with livestock and agriculture, which is, in a pre-industrial society, was essential. The soils, the agricultural potential of the interior is was terrific. The Ralph Lane, the governor of the first colony, wrote a letter to England saying that they, they had found the, the mainland, the main, the main to be the goodliest soil under the cope of heaven. He wasn't talking about the sand dunes out on the beach. So they had to get off and get into the 
get off Roanoke Island and get into the interior to have the possibilities of a of a thriving colony. You just weren't going to get it out on the beach. Um, yeah. And it's just it's, and, and some of our uh, experts on Native Americans say have said you know the soils that you have to have to grow corn and beans and pumpkins and things that there were in the native agriculture you have to have those soils to survive and to have a working society and you don't find those on the seashore yeah that that actually makes a lot of sense and, and honestly it's almost as soon as the question was out of my mouth i started to think about you probably couldn't even grow a turnip out there close to the ocean in in, in that sandy soil now, well, that island grows turnips. one thing really really well it grows collards you eat collards <laughs> Of course we do. <laughs> you should. It's, they're, they're wonderful. They sound terrible, but they're wonderful. But no. collard yeah, patches. Yeah, they're really good. Collard patches were very, very. Uh, collards growing was very big on Roanoke Island in the 1800s. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so what's the next step in the Roanoke research for First Colony Foundation? Well, we have several avenues we're going to pursue. We we certainly. Are looking at underwater archaeological research. We are our underwater archaeologists. We hope will work in Salmon Creek to see if there are any submerged uh, remains. We want to. We are probably going to. Uh, I, I think there's a strong interest in expanding and going back to what is called Site Y, which is a second site, a site which corroborates Site X. Actually, a little, maybe even a little stronger because there's no Native American presence. Uh, at site at site Y, and there's good artifact uh, distribution and variety. Go in and go and go a little further into the uh, testing of site Y, as we call it, which is about a mile north of site X. They're both very close. Uh, uh, maybe some more further archaeological survey in that area. And also go back to Roanoke Island, and we, there's some things about the Science Center. Uh, that Noel Hume excavated in the 1990s that are now seem a little confusing to us. We'd like to do a little more work to clarify some of the structural evidence of the Science Center. We have pretty good ideas as to what kind of furnace, metallurgical furnace, Joachim Gans was using. We'd like to know a little bit more about what sort of structure was up and around it. Absolutely. Well, you guys have plenty of work to do, and of course, we will certainly be watching as things proceed. Phil, I also want to thank you for joining us here to talk about your work and uh, how it has uh, taken place over the last several years. I'm sure how it is certain to continue, and we hope to hear more from you here in the future on the Seven Ages Audio Journal, okay? Okay. Well, I'll tell your listeners here, and you as well, check in periodically with our website, www.firstcolonyfoundation.com. All one word, firstcolonyfoundation.org. We post things there. We, we're kind of exploring in, with the Facebook thing. We're not, I'm not a big Facebook person, but we've, we've got somebody that wants to, is doing something with that. But look at the website, www.firstcolonyfoundation.org. Uh, and, and there's a lot of information. There's a lot of great history on there. There's a lot of good archaeological reports, a lot of... Uh, a lot of the story that we want people to learn, not just chase the lost colonists. We want them to learn the history. That can be found on our website and in many publications, which we think are of great value. Absolutely. All that linked on the website. And again, that is firstcolonyfoundation.org. You will find separate reports about the actual dig reports. You've got archaeology, the history, virtual sites. They've also got their social media links and a lot of images and maps that you can follow as well. So again, Phil... We will certainly check in with you again in the future, and thank you for your time this evening. It's been a fantastic conversation. Enjoyed it. It was a good conversation. We'll we'll be in the field. We hope within the next few months. It's winter. We were in the field this in the winter last year, but if if we can dance around COVID, we'll be out there and trying to dig where we can. Special thanks again to Philip Evans of the First Colony Foundation for joining us and for being our guest. 
and for, of course, providing us additional details on the ongoing efforts of the foundation of which he is the president. They are one of those groups who has long endeavored to try and help us bring a full account to the historical record of what happened to the Roanoke colonists. And again, we may never know, but I still think that there are many things that we can learn about this process through archaeology, historical archaeology, historical detective work, and the efforts of organizations like Phillips. So thank you again to Mr. Evans and the fine folks that are doing that work. Now, I have a question for you guys. Before we get into this segment, I'm about to uh, drop on you here. James, what year were you born? 1971. As a matter of fact, I reached level 50 uh, this month. You did, and a happy belated 50th birthday to you here on the microphone. I hear that you got a wonderful gift from your lovely lady fair. You know. You were born just a few years after 1968, one of the most contentious years in America and especially in American politics. And it was a year not only that was an election year, but also a year that we saw unfolding on camera one of American history's most famous feuds. I challenge you to a duel. Now go away or I shall taunt you a second time. Go on, get... Famous feuds. So let me... Set the stage here for you after doing my famous impersonation of Sam Elliott there. It was 1968, and we had the highly contentious election between Richard Nixon and Hubert Humphrey. But, you know, also, George Wallace was running as an independent that year. And George Wallace, talk about a very controversial character in American history. You know, that being one of the many things that was happening in the midst of that election. But... We also had ABC News and its famous coverage of the election, and they had decided that they were going to bring in partisan pundits on the left and the right to give commentary of both the Republican National Convention that was held that year in Miami Beach and then also the Democratic National Convention held in Chicago. And so the ABC panel was moderated by Howard K. Smith, and the panelists that they bring in are none other than conservative commentator William F. Buckley, who is the publisher of National Review. And then we also had the American left-leaning novelist and political commentator Gore Vidal, two guys who absolutely hated each other's guts. And for anybody who's unfamiliar with this story, there's a great film that was made about this called Best of Enemies that is all about this feud. And this is one of my favorite in the history of, well, American history, because the guys get on camera, they're constantly trying to find ways to outfox the other. You know, Vidal kind of always has fascinated me because although you've got Buckley, who is, you know, the leading conservative intellectual in the country at that time, a Yale educated guy, I think he'd actually been a member of Skull and Bones. And he is the epitome of the kind of aristocratic high society conservative elite. Then you've got Vidal, who actually had never gone to college, but was absolutely delighted with the fact that he and very proud of how he didn't have to have this kind of American Ivy League education to be able to, you know, match wits with Buckley. And so he was hiring researchers who were digging up information about Buckley. And when Buckley would say something, Vidal wasn't necessarily offering a counterpoint so much as he was attacking Buckley. And Buckley realized, well, this is really going to be a much more interesting matchup probably than I'd anticipated. And so over the course of, you know, several successive nights, things get even more and more tense, but eventually it all kind of comes to a head Live on television, they're sitting there, they're talking. And this is famously depicted in the film. At one point, Vidal asks Buckley to shut up for a minute. And Buckley's essentially saying, you know, in that Northeastern, almost English-sounding accent of his, no, I will not shut up. And Vidal calls him a crypto-Nazi. Now, for weeks, he'd been looking for the best way to push Buckley's buttons. And that seemed to have been it. And Buckley, on... Live television says, now listen, and I can't actually repeat it here, folks. This is a family-friendly program. But he says, now listen, you blank. Stop calling me a crypto-Nazi or I'll smash you in your GD face. And you will stay plastered. (laughs) And so, yeah. And so Howard, the moderator, is sitting there, gentlemen, gentlemen, let's calm down. (laughs) This is on live television. So anyway, meanwhile, Vidal realizes, I got you. And he's sitting back, and he's smiling, you know. (laughs) I got him on camera. You have showed yourself, Mr. Buckley, to be the beast that you actually are. Well, the feud didn't end there on television. 
And the way that this actually goes on, both of the men continue to fight each other through, you know, columns that they publish in various different magazines, sometimes Buckley in his own publication, National Review, sometimes Vidal in other publications, and they're filing lawsuits and counter lawsuits against each other for years. Uh, as we see, Buckley never really able to live down what he did and how he lost his cool on national television like that. We see simultaneously Gore Vidal's novel sales dwindling, his popularity, his influence as an American intellectual fading. And so both men were struggling with themselves, their own kind of fading appeal in the American dialogue amidst their eternal hatred for each other. And I'm sure wherever either of those guys are, if there's an afterlife, they still aren't getting along. They never would have reconciled. But that truly, my friends, ranks among the greatest of recent history's greatest feuds. What yeah, say you ye? Know, you know, and and it can't be understated that that was on live television in 1968. Yeah. People's, you know, people's morals and the, and the, Ideas that people had just in general in the country were very, very different and much more conservative than they are today. Even for the liberal folks, that would that had to be shocking for everybody. Well, certainly. And, you know, again, the thing I would say in recent years, we've seen a lot of conflict in America. Let's just put it that way. But interestingly, and this is what I always tell people. Yeah, things have been bad. Things haven't been perfect. But if you look back at history just a few decades ago, I would argue you know, starting with the assassination of, well, not even starting with Kennedy's assassination. I mean, we were already in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. The collective sigh of relief after the Second World War had just been exhaled, and we're already seeing all this other conflict. Then we have an American president assassinated. His brother runs for president and is assassinated. I mean, look at what was happening in the world at that time. Imagine, and many Americans in this audience listening to this podcast lived that. Many of you guys out there lived through that. You know that. So, I mean, even in recent memory, at least as far as a few decades ago, many people, my mom and dad, you know, as a kid growing up, I always heard this story, especially from my mom. She said we were all sent home on the day that what unfolded down there at the Dallas motorcade occurred. Mm -hmm. But we think we've got it bad these days. I'm not trying. Maybe you can't even compare it. And so I'm not trying to. But, I mean, I will acknowledge that if you look at history and you know history— it does help you to kind of ground yourself in where we are today and to understand what we don't do, you know, how to do it better and how progress can be achieved. That's, again, why we, I think, all of us look at history, no matter what your beliefs or your values are, your core fundamental principles. If we know history, we can avoid the mistakes that we made in the past and we can maybe do better for ourselves in the future. That's a very good point. Well, thank you, friend. And, of course, that's also why we have a little fun with history in remembering these famous feuds. And we hope you guys will remember to go over there and follow us on Instagram, on Twitter, on YouTube. And, of course, if you are so inclined, you can support our efforts by dropping us a donation there at sevenages.org. Well, gentlemen, it is now officially about time for us to pony up. We haven't mentioned on this episode yet not one time, the famous Cross Time Pub. We're still here. I see they are still serving. Will you guys join me for one more before we hit the road? Yeah, it's always happy hour at the Cross Time Pub, my friend. Bet it certainly is. Well, Jason, thank you. James, thank you. And thanks to all of you guys out there who support our efforts. We are the Seven Ages Research Associates. This is the Seven Ages Audio Journal. And next time, of course, we will continue to probe the mysteries of the ancient past as we go in pursuit of knowledge of history and archaeology right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Mm -hmm.